Hey, good morning, Revolution Church. It's good to see all of you. I am at uh, Matt Johnson's apartment complex in the community center. It's a great place near downtown Houston. And uh, I hope you've got the family gathered around, ready to worship the Lord Jesus this morning. So get everybody gathered around the laptop or the tablet, or hopefully you have it up on the big screen. There's two new families that are new to Revolution that want to say hi. And here we go. Hi, Revolution Church. Uh, we're the Dements. My name is Greg Dement. This is my wife, Linda. Hello. And our daughter, Eliana. Say hi. <laughs> uh, we are relatively new to the church. We uh, started going, uh, we, we visited the church in March for the first time. That was just before the COVID thing happened. So we've been uh, sticking around virtually and getting to uh, hear uh, Pastor Gary's sermons and slowly getting to to know people over time uh, thankfully we got to come and and visit face to face for a few s services when things came back and yeah. unfortunately now we're back virtual but we are looking forward to uh, getting to know more of you and getting to to get back to normal after all this ends um, so uh, we hope you have a, a a great service and just look forward to uh, getting um. to know you more yeah, look forward to getting to know you guys. Um, it's just been a pleasure so far getting to know members of your church, and um, we just feel really welcomed, and we're thankful for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. Bye. This is Lauren. I'm Ryan. And um, we're new to the area, and we were looking for a church that we could call our home, and Revolution Church just really stuck out to us. We loved that. It was non-denominational. Um, we loved how it was come as you are. That was one thing my husband really liked about it. Um, he really loved Pastor Gary whenever he was listening to him. He listened to him first online, and then I, I started listening to him, too, and we just fell in love with his sermons. Um, and so we went to one of the services not too long ago, and um, we really felt comfortable being in there. We had a lot of people come up to us afterwards and speak to us and introduce themselves and um, tell their kind of their story of how they found the church. So we're really excited. Um, we're having a big baby. I'm 20 weeks now, so... Um, we're excited to grow with the church. Hey, we're going to do question and answer time a little different this morning. So if you have a question and you want to, I'm going to call you. So text me and just say, call me, and then I'll let you read your question. We'll do it live, and we'll have my phone in my hand so everybody can hear your question, and you and I will have a conversation. If you'd rather... Just ask the question anonymously. Just text out the whole question, and I won't, I won't call you. But So you can either text me and say, call me, and ask it, or you can just text out the question, okay? But that will make liven things up a little bit later. And at the end of the, my message, we'll have the question answer. So any question about the Bible, about Colossians, or just life in general, okay? And then also, if this is your first time on the live stream, man, we want to say thanks for um, watching with us. And uh, we want you to text me. This is my cell phone number here. And you can look, you can uh, just text me your name. And, and if you have any questions about Revolution Church, questions about Jesus or anything, I'd love to get to connect with you and get to know you. So here's what I want to do. We want to start things off with prayer. And I want someone in your home right there or wherever you're watching from to volunteer to lead your group in prayer. And then I'll say a short prayer at the end. If you're by yourself, you can pray by yourself. But let's have a conversation with Jesus and invite him in to this live stream worship service. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we just want to tell you we love you this morning, and we want to thank you so much for the way you demonstrate your love for us in the greatest sacrifice of, of giving your son, your only son, Jesus, to die in our place, to wipe away all of our sins, and that he resurrected to give us life eternal. Lord, we look forward to that day more than ever. In a world that's so chaotic and crazy right now, we just look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ, and we want to until then, worship you with spirit and in truth. We want to worship God passionately. We want to love one another genuinely. We want to start a revolution in our world through the love of God. Pray that you'll be with this live stream this morning. Pray that we would grow from your word and be encouraged by your spirit. In Jesus' name, And everybody said amen. Well, hey, we're glad you joined us this morning. We're going to have a worship service by a friend of Revolution Church, Chris Cobb. So 
Sing along, even though it may be awkward for you in your living room, just sing along with Chris this morning as he leads us in worship. Hey, good morning, Revolution Church. I'm really glad to be with you guys this morning. You know, as I read through Colossians, uh, I learn about the sovereignty and the supremacy of our God, and I'm just always amazed at the way that He makes a way for us through Jesus on the cross, how the creator of everything, the Alpha and the Omega, would put us first. Uh, it's just, I can't think of any better reason to worship and uh, to say that, you know, God, you are great. You are our way maker. You're our miracle worker. You are our promise keeper. And you just find a way. You never stop working for us, uh, even in the midst of this pandemic. So let's worship this morning and let's tell him how great he is. Stop. 
darkness, my God, that is who you are. Come on, everybody. Great. 
All right, so be prepared to read the scriptures, and our scripture readers this morning is the Gilmores. So read along with them, would you? Revolution. Good morning. Today we're going to read Colossians chapter 1, verses 23 through 29. Curtis will read the odds, and I will read the even. Say hi, CJ. Say good morning. That's not happening. All right, so uh, verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now rejo- Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. All right. Happy Sunday, Revolution. Happy Sunday, guys. So I want to ask you a question. Where is your life going right now? Do you feel like you're going in the wrong direction? Is it possible that your life is heading towards the wrong goal? I want to show you a video of a football player who is heading in the wrong direction. Many of you will recognize it immediately as Jim Marshall. Looking. Does. Stops. Throws. Completes it to Kilmer up at the 30-yard line. Kilmer driving for the first down. Loses the football. It's picked up by Jim Marshall, who's running the wrong way. Marshall is running the wrong way, and he's running it into the end zone the wrong way. Thinks he scored a touchdown. He has scored a safety. His teammates were running along the far side of the field, Russ, trying to tell him to find <laughs> That player was running the wrong way, wasn't he? And the whole time, he's running about 45 yards and the crowd's cheering and he doesn't realize that the home team crowd is cheering because he's going the wrong way. And, and there's players on his team that are yelling at him but he can't hear them because there's so much noise from the crowd that he doesn't hear that, hey, you're going the wrong way. You know, sometimes that's the way it is in life. We think we've got our life planned out and we're reaching towards certain goals but those wrong goals are heading us towards the wrong goal line. And we can't hear because of all the noise of the world to, that people are, are actually screaming at us, friends. The Holy Spirit, the Word of God is saying, hey, you're going the wrong way. And it isn't until we get to the end that we realize, well, wow, I totally messed up. I feel bad for Jim Marshall because he was a great football player, but he's notorious and most well-known for this play right here, the, the one big mistake that he made. Uh, and you know what? But we don't want to be known at the end of our life that we went the wrong way. This scripture here this morning in in Colossians is going to help us put our life on the wrong track, heading towards the right goal line. So um, Jesus set the tone for us. He said in verse 26 of Matthew chapter 20, he said, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And some translations say must be your minister. Now, before you start saying, oh, that means you're a full-time pastor. No, that's not what this verse means at all. In fact, today we're going to be talking about being a minister, but not necessarily being a pastor or someone in full-time ministry, as we call it. If you want to be great, you need to serve other people. You need to minister to other people. Verse 28 says, even as the Son of Man, referring, Jesus referring to himself, came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus set the tone for our lives that that the goal line that we should be heading for is not to see how our money can serve us, our house can serve us, our employees and other people can serve us, but how we can serve other people. Is that the goal line your life is heading towards? Paul here in Colossians says, I became a minister. And so he talks, there's three types of ministers and there's three ways he uses this word in the Bible. He talks about a minister. This word literally means diakonos, means a waiter, or even a busboy. 
This is how Paul saw himself. He saw himself as the person who cleans up the mess after other people in the churches. And then he served other people as a lowly servant cleaning tables and waiting on tables. Another word he used all throughout the New Testament was doulos, which means a bond servant. We talked about that a lot in the book of Philemon. Someone who is serving someone by choice to do whatever they say to pay off a debt or for whatever reason they do that. A bond servant. The third word he uses, a servant, is sometimes the Greek word huperetes, which means a, a rower. In ships, you had people rowing the boat, but on really big ships, they had the, they had the top, they had the middle, and then the third low, lowest galley. And those people were down in a dark, dreary place rowing, and many of them were slaves. They were actually chained to their rowing spot. You remember the movie um, Ben-Hur? I was thinking about, when I was reading about this with Paul, about being a third galley rower. In the movie, Ben-Hur, he was actually captured and made a slave and was forced to row like this. And there'd be someone who would beat a drum to set the cadence and the tempo for the rowing. And there'd be Roman soldiers, you know, whipping people to tell them to row, row faster. And this is where Ben-Hur found himself in the situation. This is Paul's view of ministry. I, I'm a bond servant. I'm a busboy. I'm a third galley rower. I'm the lowest of the low, just serving in a lowest possible way to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and to serve him. That's a very interesting picture of ministry, isn't it? It's very opposite of what you'll see televangelists say. Their view of ministry is $65 million jet planes and mansions and living the high life and that they make millions of dollars in the ministry. <laughs> That's not Paul's view of ministry at all. Paul didn't go into the ministry to be served and to get jets and planes and mansions and things like that. He went in to serve, to give his all, to be a servant of Jesus Christ. I think that's a better view of ministry, don't you say? Um, so the question next is, who is in the ministry? Who is in the ministry? Yes, there are people like myself who are vocational ministries. That is our career. And I'm very thankful that Revolution Church is a generous church to where I'm able to support my family by serving the Lord full time. I don't have to deal with bounce down anymore. Praise God. Seriously, that's such a relief. And I'm, I thank the Lord for that. Uh, I hate that it took a pandemic to bring that, but the Lord works in incredible ways to work things out for his glory and our good. But I'm a vocational minister, and there's a, there's a lot of people that make a career like it. It's biblical. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.17 and Luke 10.7 talks about people who are worthy, laborers worthy of the hire, and that you don't mu muzzle the ox that the ox can feed on the corn as part of the harvest, as so pastors can partake of the offerings to support their family. It's a biblical concept. Um, you do see also bivocational ministers. These are people who get paid nothing or very little by their church, so they have to work a, a, re a secular job or another job. Sometimes it's called co-vocational, but that's a whole other subject. Uh, bivocational ministers support their income from two ways, or at least maybe a church pays them nothing or very little. And then there's... Um, the third, which is lay ministers, this is a, a church term. It just means everyday people in the church who have a regular job, they're not on staff or full-time pastors or even pastors or, or any type of staff member, but they just serve the Lord and they call that a lay minister. And that would be the majority of Revolution Church. Ephesians 4.12 spells that out for us. Um, it says in, in verse 11, it says, and he gave, it's to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers. Which is interesting, in the Greek, there is no word and there. It's shepherds slash teachers. Your pastor or shepherd and your teachers, one in the same role. And why did he give all these leaders to the church? This is really powerful here. It says to equip the saints. Now look at somebody next to you and say, that's me, okay? The, the saints is all the believers in the church... And God gave your pastor and your teachers to your church to equip you to do what? For the work of the ministry. Who does the ministry? Not the ministers, the pastors, the elders, the clergy only, but the whole body of Christ, all the saints do it. And why do we do the work of the ministry? For the building up of the body of Christ. The Revolution Church is built up by the saints, by every member being a minister and equipping the, bo the body and edifying the body. So 
Who is in the ministry? The answer to that question is all believers should be in the ministry. Every member, every attender of Revolution Church should see themselves as a minister. Now, remember, I've taught this before. There was the apostles, you know, Peter, James, Paul, and all those, capital A, if you will, which means sent one. But in, in that sense, we're all an apostle, little a. We're all sent to carry the gospel. There are the disciples, the 12, okay, which means a follower or a student. But we're all disciples of Jesus Christ, little d, right? There is the pastor of a church who shepherds the flock, but in a sense, we're all pastors. We shepherd at least our own children, if not one another. There are deacons that are recognized for special service, for special ministry, and that means a servant or a waiter. And then, to, But in that sense, we're all servants, aren't we? We're all deacons in that sense of the word. And then there could be a minister, which Paul talks about himself being a minister called by Jesus Christ to minister the gospel to the Gentiles. But in that sense, again, we're all ministers. So hopefully that helps put it in perspective. So I have six points. Don't let that scare you, okay? I'm just going to take three or four minutes on each one. We're going to talk about the spirit of ministry, the suffering of ministry, the scope of ministry, the subject of ministry, and the strategy and the strength of ministry. And some of this I borrowed from John MacArthur. If you read a lot of his stuff, you'll realize it's good stuff. It's gold. But uh, this is my points this morning. So let's start with the spirit of ministry. By spirit, I mean the attitude of ministry. What should be your attitude when you minister? Paul starts it off by saying, now I rejoice. When he talks about ministry, it's something that makes Paul stoked. He is super excited about ministry. He just cannot wait to do what God has called him to do. That should be our attitude when we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, with COVID-19, a lot of ministry is kind of put on hold. But there's still some going on. We can't do it at our building or at our new building, but we can do it in other ways. You know, I really appreciate all this is happening right now because of Matt Johnson. He, he gets here early, he sets us up, and you can tell he's excited about what he does. He rejoices in the ministry and serving in, one, in a small way. He doesn't get paid to do any of this. He, he spends a lot of his own time and money to make this happen. So you can give kudos to Matt if you want to on the live stream there. But do you rejoice in the way that you serve God? You should be excited about it. Now, it doesn't mean that sometimes ministry isn't hard. It doesn't mean that every time you change diapers, you're like, yay, a number two, I'm excited about this. We're not always that way. But your overall perception of how you serve God should bring excitement. It should bring rejoicing. One of my favorite verses in Psalm 102, 100, verse 2, is, is serve the Lord how? With gladness. We should be glad to serve God. As my wife would often say, we don't have to serve God. We get to serve God. It is a privilege. It is something we are excited about. 1 Thessalonians 2.19. Listen to what Paul says. He said, for what is our hope or joy? What is our crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Is it not you? You see, what, what, what brings excitement to ministry is seeing other people grow in Christ because of your ministry. And that brings incredible joy to your life. When you see a seven-year-old ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of their life and get baptized, and you had a part to play in that, that's amazing. That's what ought to bring you excitement. You know, we get excited about a lot of things. We get excited if our sports team wins. We get excited, you know, about our job. If we get a new job, if we get a raise. We get excited about a new house. And those are good. Nothing wrong with that. But what should bring the ultimate excitement to you is seeing what, how God is using you to minister to others so that they become more like Jesus. That's exciting. So let's talk about the suffering of ministry. Yeah, ministry is not always easy. Now, living in America, we don't suffer near as much as other believers. I was listening this morning to a, um, a devotion by David Platt talking about believers in the Himalayas where Everybody in that village worships false gods. And this mom and dad became Christians. And the elders of the village were telling them that that was wrong and they needed to get rid of their, 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 their false god and, and, and believe in their pagan gods. And they, got, they came under a lot of persecution. And then one day the elders of the village came to their daughter and said, we have bad news, your parents were killed in an avalanche. It turned out they found out weeks later that the village elders actually stoned them to death and then pushed them down the cliff, and they called it an avalanche. 
In some parts of the world, we have brothers and sisters in, in Christ that are suffering because of the ministry. Now, we may suffer because we have to get a little bit early to get to church. We, we may suffer because we may have to stay a little bit longer to clean up. But our suffering is nothing compared to the suffering of other people. But Paul says, now I rejoice in my suffering. He's not rejoicing in the ministry. He's rejoicing in the suffering of the ministry. But why? Because he's doing it for other people. When, you, when ministry gets hard, when helping out someone tends to backfire on you a little bit, if you realize you're doing it for other people's sake to see them grow in Christ, that could be the source of joy and rejoicing. Let me ask you a question. How much did Paul suffer? Well, we know he suffered a ton. Listen to what he says here. when he t- He's talking to the, sen- to the believers in, the, Corin- in Corin- the Corinth, the Corinthian believers, and they, were, they had people in their church saying, Paul's not really an apostle. He wasn't one of the 12. He's like, well, well wait a minute. I, he said, are they the servants of Christ? He and he says, I am a better one. And he says, I am talking like a madman. He said, I'm being sarcastic here. But I'm a better servant than all of them. If you want to measure by suffering, watch how much better I am. He says, with far greater labors, more imprisonments, with countless beatings. He had been beaten so many times he's lost count. Often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. By law, you couldn't beat someone 40 times, so they'd give them 39 Okay, three times I was beaten, not with just lashes or a whip, but with rods. That hurts just thinking about it. Once I was stoned, <laughs> okay, three times I was shipwrecked, three times. Man, if I was Paul, I'd be taking a cab or Uber ride everywhere after the first shipwreck. But he kept persevering and to be shipwrecked three times. In fact, one time, 24 hours, he was adrift at sea. And then he had, talks about this frequent journeys, Dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles. He's, he's like Will Robinson, danger, danger, danger. Remember that old robot? He's a danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. So he was getting it from every angle, from his Jewish brothers to Gentiles to fake brothers. He was being persecuted on all different directions, in toil and hardship through many sleepless nights, and in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Man, Paul was tough. Paul went through all this and he kept on going. And because of that, we have approximately half our New Testament because of the life of Paul, because he suffered through it. Sometimes when Christians suffer, they're like, oh, I give up. I thought it was going to be easy. No, it's not meant to be easy. But it is meant to be rewarding. It is meant to bring you joy and rejoicing. So how much do we suffer compared to Paul? (laughs) I would say very little, right? Especially, again, we're spoiled in America. And as times, and you can see the attitude towards Christians changing, especially with this COVID-19 and a lot of other unrest in our country, you see the attitude towards towards Christians becoming more and more hostile. But you know what that's going to do? That's going to separate the wheat from the tares. You're going to see who the true believers are and then who are persecuted, who fade away, showing that they're not true believers. Um, he said, in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. Now, some people who especially teach false doctrine read this and say, oh, see, Christ's affliction was lacking. You know, Jesus died for your sins, but it wasn't enough. You've got to do more to make up for it. That's not what this verse is saying at all. Listen to what he's saying. He said, in my flesh... I am filling up what's lacking. But I'm filling it up in Christ's affliction. Let me look at it this way. So let's say this is the life of Jesus. Full of suffering. Completely, almost completely in this dark. But Jesus' life was completely full of suffering. He He suffered every bit that he needed to suffer to pay the price for our sins. On the cross, he said the Greek word tetalistai, which means paid in full. That's when he said it is finished. Jesus suffered every bit he needed to suffer to pay for your sins and mine on the cross. But Paul says, I haven't suffered as much as Jesus has. In fact, I am making up for what's lacking with Christ's suffering. That's what he means. He said, I've suffered a bunch, but not as much as Jesus has. My life is not completely full, so I am filling up. He's going to continue to fill up with Christ's suffering right here, and but that doesn't deplete any from him, but he wants his life to be full. That's what it's talking about in that verse. So hopefully that helps you see what he's talking about. Um, then he goes on to say, 
his, the afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. When you hear about the body of Christ and you hear about the church, they are one and the same. Several passages in Scripture, three times in Colossians, it says that the body of Christ is the church of Christ. People talk about the universal church, and I understand what they mean when they say that. It's talking about all brothers and sisters in the family of God. We all share the same Heavenly Father. But that when Paul wrote the churches, he talked about the church at Colossae, the church at Philippi, the church at Thessalonica, you know, the church at Laodicea. He talked about churches in each location. Revolution Church is on its own the body of Christ. There is a bigger picture of the family of God, but each assembly, each gathering of believers, each New Testament church is the body of Christ, and Jesus Christ is the head of that. So that brings us to a question. How important is your church to you? How important is it? On your priority list, now you want to say it's high up, but really, do your actions show it? Do your prayers show it? Does the amount of time you, you spend show it? Does your excitement show it? How important is your church? I'm very thankful. We have a lot of people who worship God passionately and love people genuinely and are starting a revolution through Revolution Church. And I, I hope that you want to become one of us. I hope that you will make the body of Christ, Revolution Church, the most important thing to you after your relationship with him and his church and your family. That that's, your, that's your top three in that order right there. So the body of Christ ought to be super important to us. Then we come to the, the, the scope of ministry. The scope. What is Paul covering when he ministers? Here's the purpose of it. The scope or the purpose of his ministry is to make the word of God fully known. To make the word of God fully known. You know, children's ministry is not about babysitting. It's about making the word of God known to these little children. Teen ministry is not about entertaining a bunch of teenagers so they can have fun. It's making the word of God known. Our music ministry is not entertainment. It is meant to make the word of God fully known. Life groups, it's not about socializing, although that could be included. It's not about a great meal and about dessert. It's about making the word of God what? Fully known. First impressions ministry, when people greet you at the door when they walk into the church, what's the purpose? To make them feel welcome so they can come on in and make the word of God fully known. That ought to be the purpose of every ministry in Revolution Church. Ministry is all about teaching the Word of God and living the Word of God so that people can see, wow, God really is amazing. Jesus really is our Savior. That's the whole purpose of ministry. Let's move on to the subject of ministry. What is the subject of ministry? He says that the mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints. When we say something's a mystery, we mean it's a problem that can't be solved. You know, murder mysteries or whatever. Um, but that's not what the word mystery means in the Bible. The Greek word is mysterion, sometimes also translated apocalypsos or apocalypse. It means something that's covered, that's revealed. That's why the last book of the Bible is called the Revelation, the revealing or the apocalypse. Okay, because it's, it's something that's been covered, but now is revealed. And what is that? It's been revealed to us his saints, and he goes on to say, to them God chose to make known, what are we making known? How great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Think about that. We just learned last week how all the fullness of the Godhead is in Christ. And now here's the mysterion, the mystery, that all the fullness of Christ is in you. That ought to blow your mind. If to think of all the fullness of the Godhead, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that the omnipotent, omnipresent, all-powerful God all was wrapped up in one man, Jesus Christ, and now that, the spirit of that man is all in you. That's something that the Old Testament saints couldn't comprehend. They didn't see the church coming. They didn't see. They saw Jews and Gentiles. And they saw it this way, Jews and Gentiles. But God said, hey, let me show you something. We're going to take Jews and Gentiles, we're going to take Greeks and Arabs and Africans and Europeans and we're going to mix them in together and make one beautiful body of Christ. And that is Christ in you. Now watch this. The word you there is not you singular. It's like we say in Texas, y'all. Y'all. It's y'all plural, plural. You plural. Christ in y'all, the church, the hope of glory. 
So when we gather together as a church, which I'm missing that greatly, and we're hoping to meet together soon, but when we gather together as the body of Christ from all different levels of education, different levels of income, different colors of people, and we gather together as the body of Christ, it's a beautiful thing. The body of Christ is meant to be diverse. The body of Christ is meant to be everybody all together. Christ in us, the church, the hope of glory. That's a beautiful passage of scripture. So let's talk next about the strategy of ministry, the strategy of ministry. Him we proclaim. It's not about talking about us. It's talking about Jesus. We proclaim him. We open up our mouths and we talk. And what do we do? It says warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. There's the strategy. Open up your mouth and talk about it. But do you know that there's a warning? We're actually warning people, hey, there's a judgment coming. You and I, all of us, have sinned against an almighty God. And if we don't repent of our sins and allow Jesus to pay the price for those sins, we will be judged. And there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. That's a warning. I don't know about you, but that, that's uncomfortable. People don't want to be warned. But if you saw a truck coming and someone standing in the middle of the road, you would warn them, say, hey, get out of the way. There's a truck coming. To keep your mouth silent would show no love and compassion whatsoever. Warning people shows the truest love. But we not only warn them, we teach them. We open up the scriptures and we show them from God's word what the gospel is. And we do that with all wisdom. You've got to no, you got to do it in a wise approach, a different approach for each people, depending on what their need is. And the purpose of that is to present everyone mature. Everybody say mature. Good. Mature in Christ. That's the purpose of this. So Galatians, said, Paul says it this way, my little children for whom I am again in anguish of childbirth. Paul says, I feel like I'm having a baby. I'm having contractions. I'm in a lot of pain. And I'm going to have this pain until Christ is formed in you. He, he equates it with giving birth to a child is delivering someone to where they become mature in Christ, where Christ is formed in them. So what does a mature Christian look like? Well, I could give you my opinion on that, but I think it would be better to let the scripture speak for itself. Listen to this carefully, because this is the reason a lot of people get saved and they grow and then they plateau and some to even decline. Watch this carefully. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled of righteousness. And I'm sorry, everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Milk is what babies drink, right? And that's what they need at first. And newborn believers need the milk of the word. There's some basic ABCs of scripture that everybody needs since he's a child. But solid food, some of the deeper things of scripture, is for the mature. For those who have their, watch this, and he defines what maturity is. Having their powers of discernment, trained by constant practice, and are able to distinguish between good and evil. You see, when you are a mature Christian, you have the power of discernment. You've become so well versed in the scriptures that when someone says something, your discernment antennas go up and say, wait a minute, I don't think that's completely true. When you hear a false teacher preaching the Bible, but you recognize, wait a minute, that's not right. That's not what the scriptures mean. You got the powers of discernment. And you get that by constantly practicing in the scriptures. Listening to, studying, living it out, practicing it. And when you go out in life and you get to the job, you come with a situation where you have to make a choice. You're able to distinguish between good and evil. Immature believers don't, though. They don't have discernment. They're easily tricked. They're not practicing what they believed. And they're tricked. And they're not able to always distinguish between good and evil. Right now, the world is so upside down. Things that are good are called evil, and things that are evil are called good. Have you not seen that almost every day in the news? You know, if you're a mature believer, though, that stuff is like screaming bells and whistles at you to where you're like, wait a minute, this is not right. The power of discernment. Let's move on to the strength of ministry. This, what does it take to be strong in the way that you serve other people? Paul says, for this I toil. Ministry was not always easy. It was hard work struggling, okay? Ministry is not always easy. It's, it can be all, always joyful, but it's not always easy. Watch this. With all his energy. Man, I am so glad that I do not have to minister to Revolution Church in Gary's energy. I have the power of the Holy Spirit of God to, on days when I don't feel like doing what I need to do, when I don't have the strength to do, continue to do what I do, the power of the Holy Spirit gives me that his energy and that he 
works powerfully within me. That's not just a promise for Gary or for pastors. That's a promise for all of us. We all can struggle in the ministry with his energy and that he can work powerfully in us. So how does his energy work and how does his power work in me? Here's three simple things. Meditate on scripture, pray throughout the day, and trust him in each choice. If you think about the scriptures, don't just read them and click on the new version. Okay, I'm done for today. Meditate on them. Think about what is this saying to me? Father, what are you trying to show me through the power of your Holy Spirit through this verse right now? And as I meditate on each part of that verse, and I think about it. Then I pray throughout the day that God would help me to apply what I've read. Give me strength in every decision. And then when I'm coming to a tough choice and I'm tempted to lean on my own understandings, I'm going to acknowledge him and I'm going to trust him with every choice. That's what it means to work in the power and in his energy. Let me ask you a question. Is your goal in life heading the wrong direction? You may think with full confidence you're running the race that you're meant to run and everybody's screaming at you, but you can't hear it because of all the noise of the world. And maybe you're serving yourself. You're trying to get your degree, your promotion, your bigger house, all the things that you think will make you happy. But let me tell you something. If you're trusting in those things, you're running at the wrong goal line. And you will end up in the same situation here. You see, Jesus said, again, even as the Son of Man came not to serve, but to, to, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Are you giving your life away? Jesus says if you, if you search for your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. Jesus Christ gave his life for you. If you've never been saved, he gave his life for you as a ransom. That means you were being held hostage by sin and Satan. And Jesus paid the price to set you free. Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? There is a warning. You will face God someday in judgment. But he loves you so much that he didn't just overlook your sin. He came down personally to pay the price for your sin. If you've never been saved, I want you to bow your head right now and just block out the world's distractions. I want everybody to pray. If, you're know, if you know for sure you're saved, pray for someone right now that doesn't know Christ, maybe be watching this live stream, and then maybe sitting in their living room watching this right now. So I want you to pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross to pay the ransom for my sin. Thank you for giving your life as a sacrifice for many. Thank you for ministering to me so that I can have salvation. And Lord, I pray that you would help me to live for you, to give my life for you so I can live for others like you did. Thank you for dying on the cross, for being buried and bearing all my sins there and rising from the dead with hope and victory for all who believe. I trust you as Savior in Jesus' name. Amen. If you, if you made that decision, I'd love for you to let me know. This is my cell phone number. You can call me or text me any time. Maybe you still have questions. You, you're not quite ready to make that decision. Let's talk about it, okay? All right. So in just a couple minutes, we're going to have a question and answer session. And again, you, if you don't want to talk to me on the phone, just text your question. I'll read it and answer it. But if you do, just say text me or, or just say call me, and I'll call you here shortly, okay? But let me go through a few announcements while you're doing that. Um, again, in a few weeks, we'll be moving into our new facility, and uh, it's on West Walnut there, right there on 35 and West Walnut next to the railroad tracks. And it's a bigger, better facility, and we're excited about it. And uh, let me tell you the timetable, okay? So pay attention. This is important. Here's our launch schedule. We're going to launch at our new facility in just a few weeks. Next Sunday, we're going to live stream from the Sportsplex. We'll have the band there, or at least part of the band, and we'll have our tech crew and some people that will be helping to set up. It'll be a skeleton crew, and we'll be live streaming from there. The next Sunday after that, the 26th, we'll do the same thing, but with some more volunteers. It'll be kind of like a dress rehearsal. We'll do everything we'll be doing um, for a regular in-person service, but just without every, all the audience there, okay? So there'll be more people on that Sunday. And then on August 2nd will be our launch day. We'll have blast off in our new facility with everyone, with an asterisk there, everyone present. Everybody will be invited. Let me tell you what the asterisk means, okay? We're going we're gonna to be together, and we're going to do it safely. We're going to follow the governor's guidelines. We've talked to... Um, the chairman of our fellowship of churches has advised us on this. We've gotten some medical advice and following the state's guidelines. Here's what we've come up with. 
If you're home, if you're sick, please stay home, okay? If you've been exposed to someone with COVID-19, please stay home. If you are, are at risk, you know, because you're a very small child or because you're 65 or older, you probably ought to stay home or, again, as recommended. Also, wash your hands, sanitize your hands. We'll have sanitizing stations all throughout the place. Everybody will be required to do that when they get in. Um, masks, according to the governor's guidelines for worship, the churches are exempt, so masks are strongly encouraged but not required, okay? Um, and we're going to have bracelets for everybody, okay? There'll be three different colors of bracelets, just like the stoplight, okay? Red means I have my mask on, I'm purposely keeping socially distant, hi, and I'm going to go to my seat. I'm really not wanting to interact much. I'm here because I want to enjoy the worship service, but I'm really trying to be super cautious. For whatever reason, we're going to respect your decision to do that. Red, red recipe means I'm keeping my distance, okay? And you can say hi. Yellow means I, I'm, um, um, I'm here, I can talk to you, have a conversation and stand around, uh, but I don't want any touching. I'm not hugging, I'm not shaking hands, I'm not giving high fives. Green means you're full go, you may or may not have a mask on, and you're open. If people want to hug you or give you a handshake or a high five or elbow bump or whatever, you're open to all that, and you're not keeping distant, you can have a com up close conversation. So we're doing that in a way that respects everybody's comfort level. And, it, and you, so you let everybody know where you're at. And that's great, because in our church, we've got a variety of opinions. We've got everything from people who think this whole thing is a scam and a hoax to other people who think this is the next you know, black plague. You know, and, and we're not, we don't even, none of us know who's right on this, okay? So we're going to respect everybody's comfort level in that. Um, so we're going to ask people to con continue to maintain their physical distance uh, by the seating arrangement. We're going to have the we're seating in clusters of six chairs here, six chairs there, and all that will be spread out so that you're sitting close to your family, but you're keeping distant during worship, okay? And then we ask, most importantly at all, that you love everybody. So whether they have a red wristband on or yellow or green, that everybody is loving one another and respecting everybody's comfort levels. We all have different comfort levels through this situation. But here's the thing. We can't just keep not having church indefinitely, okay? If this is the way things are going to be for, let's say, next two years or more or forever until Jesus comes, we're not going to not have church. It's good to temporarily not have in-person gatherings for a while, until things got better. But right now, things are not getting better, so we need to come up with a plan, and this is the plan that not only from the governor, but from our fellowship, but just, and from our elders and, and, and wise counsel, this is the long-term plan. So whether in November all this comes to an end, or next year, this time, we're still doing the same thing, this is our plan going forward. So be praying about August 2nd, our launch day. We're gonna invite people to come and to join us under these precautions, and we're going to make it a big, exciting day. We're going to get together. We're going to have some banners. We're going to decorate the place. To, for those of you who remember October 6th of 2014, when we first launched, we made it a big deal. We made the place look great. We're going to do that again this time, August 2nd. All right. It's question and answer time. So let's see here. I'm going to put on my glasses here, and we'll see who's got a question for us, whether we're going to call or do it in person. Um, Here's someone offering to help with check-in for braces. Th thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, here's a question. This is a question from Carter Holton. Okay, good job. Question from the little guys. And you can keep these other questions coming in right now. Um, why would God allow Satan to tempt Adam and Eve to take a bite of fruit from the tree he told them not to? Why would God want sin he does not, if he does not like it? Man, that's a great question, Carter. Um, so, here's the thing. Before there were, was an Adam and Eve, God had s the angels, and the angels were all worshiping God. And it, we believe that there were three archangels, Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. Michael was the, mess was the, ar was the, the, ar the army uh, angel, if you will. He was the head of the, the Lord of hosts, if you will. Gabriel was the messenger angel. You know, when, when you got a message from Mary or Joseph or when, when an angel went and gave someone an in-person message, it was always Gabriel. Lucifer, we believe, was the worship angel, that he let all the hosts of heaven sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and all the praises they sang. But Lucifer made a big mistake. He wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted some of this praise for himself, and God said no, and he cast him down. 
And then basically God, what he did was he set up a test. Who is the world going to, who, who, who is greater, God or Satan? So he created people and gave them a choice. Do you want to follow Satan and his way and be like God and make decisions for yourself? Or do you want to follow me? Now, did God know they would fall? Yes. But did God cause them to fall? No. They had a free choice. Just like you, Carter, have a free choice. If mom says, I want you to go clean your room, you can go in there and play with your toys, or you can go clean your room. It's your choice. God is not making you disobey or obey. It is your choice. Yes, God is still sovereign. That's a big word. It means he's in control. But God gave Adam and Eve a choice. But even from their fallenness and their wrong choice, he's able to glorify himself by sending a savior and give people the same choice to choose Jesus or to choose their own way. So God wants you to have a choice. It'd be like if you had a, would you like to have a puppy that when you call it, it comes to you and you love it and pet it? Or would you like to have a robot dog that when you call it, it comes and it just, it just pretends to like you? You want that puppy or a child or whoever you love to choose to love you. All right, great question there, Carter. Um, let me see if there's any other questions. Okay, I guess nobody wants to be called. Maybe I scared everybody off with that tactic there. All right, um, so let me go ahead and go to the next slide for me, Matt. We, I want to dismiss you by reading this scripture together. Um, and I want you to just pray this as a prayer over one another. And uh, we're going to do that. So if you have other questions that you want me to answer after church, you can text them to me, and I'll be glad to do that. But read this scripture with me if you would. Philippians 1. Here we go. Let's read together. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory of and praise of God. I want to dismiss you with this song. God bless you. Have a great day.